Welcome to the Michigan Film Network podcast series. This is Criminal Miles, a podcast featuring the works of crime novelist Miles Lawrence. These stories contain graphic depictions of violence, adult situations, and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. This episode of Criminal Miles was brought to you by the Michigan Film Network, creators and distributors of revenue-generating entertainment since 2010. To learn more about opportunities with the Michigan Film Network, visit them at mifn.net. Criminal Miles presents... Keeping Score, written by Miles Lawrence. Chapter 1. He knew women always needed something. This one needed to be held. Needed to talk about her ex-fiancé, the guy, what's his fucking name, who'd left her at the bar. She needed another drink. She needed time to sort things out. Needed a man beside her needed space, needed comforting, needed a companion, needed, needed, needed. He knew what she really needed. She needed to die. This one needed the knife. Chance or opportunity, he thought. Which was it that caused them to cross paths? To park their cars adjacent to one another? to leave their respective bars and walk to their vehicles at exactly the same time. He looked over at her and saw that frightened, just about to cry, helpless look, complete with pale skin and pouting eyes. Are you all right? he asked. She replied without looking up. No. Well, yes. No. As she slowly began to shake her head. My fiancé just left me, and I'm a mess. I really don't want to be alone tonight. I don't know what I might do. But you... You don't want to hear about that. Nobody does. Then she brushed the bangs from her forehead, looked up, smiled, and made eye contact. Would you like to follow me back to my place? She asked with an alluring grin. And there it was chance or opportunity but that was over an hour ago Ellen she introduced herself as she extended her hand just before ushering him inside since then she hadn't shut up once constantly switching from one emotion to the next jumping from one subject to another all about her or how What's-His-Face screwed up and cost himself the best thing he'd ever possibly get. Her, her problems, her needs. Oh, please get me a drink. Her worries. Pour yourself one, too. Her life. Oh, not too much ice, please. Her stress. Oh, can you please slice me a lime? Back to the knife. The only thing that would ultimately shut this domineering bitch up. Even though he was enjoying the build-up and having fun toying with this bitch, the way a cat plays with a mouse, still he wondered, just how much more of this shit could he take? He smiled, got up from the couch, walked into the kitchen, and immediately started fixing drinks, while looking for her cutlery. Tumblers and ice and knives, he chortled, a paring knife for your lime, a butcher knife for your throat, he said to himself. What was that? Ellen called from the living room. I said, one lime or two. Three, please, Ellen said. Naturally, he thought. He scowled as he began to slowly carve each lime into precise little wedges, each one exactly the same as the next. With each slice, he wondered just what the knife would do to her milky white skin. Would the blood spurt or simply flow from each wound? 
As three drinks turned into four, he was certain that his head was about to explode. Ellen had completely covered her childhood, from how beautiful of a baby everyone thought she was, to her brief time in the brownies, when that bitch den mother purposely cheated for her own brat, a fat little beast named Kelsey, and cost Ellen a merit badge. She was now beginning to trace him through her adolescent years. I developed boobs early, so naturally all the boys wanted me. She grinned as she reached over to clink glasses with him in an obvious attempt at toasting to her tits. Obediently, he smiled, glanced at her cleavage, and offered his glass, again thinking chance or opportunity, seeing her as nothing more than an object, not as a beautiful woman seated next to him on an expensive leather couch not as a sexy siren in a tight skimpy red dress, not as a potential sex partner, not as a lover, nor a one night stand, nothing. He consciously ignored the way that candlelight struck her face and softly enhanced her natural beauty. No, he didn't care about any of that. He simply saw her for what she truly was, his first kill. Ellen went on. In high school, someone started a rumor about her and her math teacher, and how everyone talked about it, and how all the girls hated her. Probably jealous, because they all wanted him, and, if truth be known, he probably did want to sleep with me, Ellen said, adding that she wasn't entirely sure that he didn't start the rumor himself, just to see if it'd get him into her pants. Before Ellen began with college, she excused herself to pee and sent him into the kitchen for more of those delicious little drinks. Now seated, situated with a fresh drink and an empty bladder, Ellen began to speak about her days at good old Michigan State University and how during her sophomore year, before she pledged Kappa Kappa, she dated one of her professors. English lit, she offered, not for the grade, just to see what it felt like to date an older guy. Again, she smiled, placed her hand to the side of her face, and leaned in close as if to tell him a secret. Boring, she mouthed in reference to her time with the professor. When she leaned close, again he said to himself, chance or opportunity and he wished he'd brought the knife with him from the kitchen. He envisioned slicing her throat as she leaned forward to tell her dirty little grinning secret and smiled. Ellen mistook the smile as being related to her story. She playfully smacked his knee. Come on, she said. Don't tell me you never slept with an older woman. But she never waited for the answer. That would have been something about him And there was no time for that, especially when Ellen had so much more to say about herself, her needs, her opportunities, her chances. Casually, he continued to sit back, sip at his drink, and await his chance, his opportunity. Ellen continued, and then I met, ugh, I'm too mad at him to even say his name, to honor his existence. You know what? From now on, I'm simply going to refer to him as What's-His-Name. Ellen went on. He's lucky I even gave him a second glance that day he came to my office to quote on re-engineering some doodad, she said with a dismissive flip of her hand. Then how he grinned at me like a lost puppy and kept making up excuses, reasons for coming back, and always finding time to speak with me. He pressed so hard, I finally felt sorry for him and agreed to lunch. And, well, the rest is how they say, history. She said and paused for a drink. He finally thought she was going to shut up, but, again, she found something else to talk about. Herself. Anyway, she began, I knew it was time to start thinking about the M word. Marriage, she mouthed. 
and family because my biological clock was ticking and I said, what the hell, why not him? He seems like he'll be a good provider. But go figure, asshole that he was. He screwed that up, ruined everything. My plan was to be married by 25, a mother by 30. I don't want to be the old hag at the PTA. His face must have registered something other than total amazement with her stories because Ellen finally realized that she might be losing this one. But that's not what you came over here for, is it? To listen to me rattle on about myself, she said, again, patting his knee, this time setting her hand higher on his leg. No, Ellen, you're fine, he lied. I just need to fix myself another drink. Why don't you come in the kitchen and help me, he said, gently taking her hand off his leg and pulling her up from the couch. By the time they reached the kitchen, Ellen was back at another topic and again, somehow, related to her. What about us? Wouldn't it be great if we worked out and you took what's-his-name's place and we got married? She asked as she turned away from him, placed her hands on the counter, looked out the window and sighed. Now he finally had his decision, chance, and opportunity. Casually, he palmed the knife he previously selected just for her. Ellen went on, Wouldn't that be great? We get married, get a house in some ritzy neighborhood, have three kids and a dog, a boy, Trevor, and two girls, Natalie and Jessica. She smiled. What do you think, hon? That sound like something you'd want? Opportunity, he said, smiling to himself as he walked up and stood behind her, gently placing a hand around her waist. What I want? What I really want, he whispered as he leaned close to her and softly kissed her neck. What I really want is for you to shut the fuck up, he said as he brought the kitchen knife up and ripped it across her throat, watching blood spurt out across the windows wall and counter. This episode of Criminal Miles was brought to you by the Michigan Film Network, creators and distributors of revenue-generating entertainment since 2010. To learn more about opportunities with the Michigan Film Network, visit them at MIFN. Not next. Chapter 2 Steve Shevsky turned the key to unlock the metal security door to his apartment, entered the room, stumbled, then winced as he tossed his keys towards the kitchen table. They missed and landed on the dingy tile floor as yet another night of binge drinking ended with him cloudy and unable to focus. He paused, allowed his eyes to adjust to the dim lighting, and looked around at the one-bedroom apartment that he has inhabited since the separation. The kitchen was a mess. An empty pizza box sat in the sink along with four dirty glasses, all plastic. Paper plates, his only dishes, were scattered on the counter. Some used, some not. Six empty beer cans decorated the table. Last night's supply. Steve headed for the refrigerator, an old 1960s style green one with one door and an ice box on the top that looked and acted like a styrofoam cooler. He lived in the apartment for six months and has yet to clean it. Steve owns practically nothing and feels he needs even less. Throwing out the empty fast food boxes and discarding the paper plates clears the kitchen. Dishes were done only when he couldn't find a clean glass to drink from. The stove has been used a grand total of three times since he took up residence. All three times his girlfriend had cooked for him. And now Steve had just ended that. He ended the relationship for good. No more sex, no more home-cooked meals, no more talking late into the night about his day. No more nothing. 
Tony had gotten too close. She had asked for too much too soon. She wanted a commitment from him, and Steve knew that he wasn't over his wife yet. He knew that he would never be able to put Stacy and their daughter out of his mind. Sure, the sex with Tony was great, the gymnastic, hungry sex of two lonely souls, but Tony wanted more. She wanted a true relationship. He wasn't ready for that. Steve Shevsky, Sergeant, Detroit Police Homicide Investigator, still longed to be with his ex-wife and daughter. One big, happy family, like it used to be so long ago, before the problems, before the drinking, before the blackouts. He grabbed a cold beer from the icebox and slammed the door. Why did Tony have to ask for more? Why did Stacy ask me to leave? He asked as he cracked open the bottle and took a long drink. I still love her and I know deep down inside, she still loves me. He staggered into the living room and grabbed the remote to turn on the television, then slowly ambled across the room and dropped in his old worn out black leather easy chair. Its handle is busted and the recliner no longer reclines, but to him, it's more than he needs or deserves. Steve, the black leather chair and the television are all that sit in the living room. It's dingy white walls, bare except for a gold plaque for expert marksmanship, are screaming for decor and paint. He ignored their cry. Single life, although lonesome, is a simple life. No possessions and no attachments. No responsibilities and nothing to come home to or for. He grabbed the remote and began to absently flip through channels, not really focusing in on any single show, just taking brief glimpses of different programs on different channels, understanding the similarities with his life, chaos, change, and him sitting, watching, and doing nothing to fix it. Why can't Stacy give me another chance? I'll change, he slurred. I'll be more open. I know I can learn to be warm and caring. The word caring was followed by a loud belch. It's 3 a.m. Steve had just gotten home from another night of heavy drinking. Drinking that has gotten progressively worse since the separation. He closed his eyes and tried to think of the two emotions ones which he lacked, emotions that have ruined his marriage and tore his life apart. The announcer on the television was running down the highlights and scores from yesterday's baseball games, American League. Steve paid no attention. He drifted back into the not-so-distant past. Stacy Shevsky, a woman in her late 30s, sits on the brown couch in her Royal Oak home. Tears no longer fall from her eyes as she explains things to her deeply upset husband. Steve, I'm sorry, she said flatly. I just cannot go on living like this anymore. I want a husband, not a robot, and surely not a cop which is all that you are anymore. I used to think of you as strong and silent. Hell, I even like those qualities in you, but it's gotten worse. Now, now you're almost stoic. You have no emotions, no compassion, and it seems no love for me or Carrie. Drinking and being a cop are all that you care about. She stared coldly at her husband determined to end their marriage. A marriage that had grown old, cold, and tiresome. Stacy was unhappy and wanted out. Steve knew that she was right on all counts, but he was unable to give the things she asked of him. Stacy, honey, you know that I love both you and Carrie. You mean more to me than anything in this entire fucking world. A tear streamed down his cheek as he spoke, his first show of emotion in God knows how long. 
Another tear welled up in his eye as he sat in the black leather chair, remembering that awful night. Lately, he realized, the tears came more easily. You say that you do, but you don't show it, Stacy said. And damn it, I won't live with a zombie. I think it's best that... I think that it's best if you move out. Go live in the apartment you keep in Detroit as your residence. Who knows, maybe... Maybe we'll be able to work things out and get back together. That was six months ago. At 7 a.m., the alarm will go off and Steve Shevsky will have to return to work. He will have to transform himself from the sad, drunken loner back into Sergeant Shevsky, police officer, for yet another day. But that's hours away. Steve took a pull from the cold brown bottle. Why did Tony have to ask for more? He mumbled. I know that breaking up was the right thing to do, he said before pausing for another swallow of beer. Why did Stacy file for divorce? He received the papers yesterday, read them and threw them across the room onto the floor where they still lay. I know that I could change. Another drink? Damn, this beer is cold. How many do I have left? Two hours later, the sharp ringing of a telephone jarred Steve from his stupor. Wearily, he pushed himself from the recliner and stumbled toward the phone, knowing it wasn't his wife with some type of emergency. She already had somebody else to call, knowing it wasn't Tony wanting to reconcile. This call was different. The ring was different. Not the sweet ring of a lover, but one sounding sharp, shrill, and cold. Its tone more serious and grave. Steve answered knowing that someone had found a body. Someone had been killed. As he listened to the caller telling him where to find the victim, his eyes began to adjust, to pull focus, until he found himself staring at his knuckles. That's when he noticed the blood. Belle Isle is covered with a heavy fog and has a lifeless body on it. Steve feels the same way. The telephone had rung too early. He didn't get enough sleep, too much alcohol and not enough recovery time. His head pounded and his eyes hurt as he turned off of Jefferson Avenue and onto the MacArthur Bridge, heading towards the crime scene. Back in the early 1800s, Belle Isle was uninhabitable. The island was overrun with snakes. The people of Detroit shipped hundreds of pigs and hogs over to the island. The hogs, in turn, killed the snakes, thus the nickname Hog Island. The people to show their appreciation to the pigs for making the island habitable, roasted the animals and ate them. Since then, a bridge has been built and Detroiters can drive or walk over about a quarter mile and use the island for recreation. It now housed a zoo and aquarium, two yacht clubs, a golf course, and many statues and monuments dedicated to famous past Detroiters. On November 29th, 1906, Harry Houdini, handcuffed, jumped from the MacArthur Bridge into the icy waters of the Detroit River. The temperature was in the low 30s. It became one of his most publicized and coldest escape stunts. Few people talk about the fact that immediately after he went into the water, Houdini escaped his shackles. Only Harry being carried downstream by the water's swift current, lost his way under the ice and was unable to find the hole with which he was first lowered into. So as the crowd above watched in amazement for the magician to reappear, Houdini fought against the current, struggling to find air pockets between the ice-covered river and its swiftly moving current, as he desperately searched for his escape route from the icy waters of the Detroit River. When Houdini finally emerged from the freezing water, 
few people realized that they had truly witnessed one of Harry Houdini's greatest tricks, surviving the Detroit River's swift current and treacherous undertow. Sergeant Shevsky's feat on this day was less spectacular. Steve, still drunk, managed to swerve in and out of traffic in his haste to arrive at the murder scene. The phone call was from his boss, Lieutenant Scanlon. An early morning jogger found a mutilated body of a white female near the Newsboy Monument, the statue of the founder of the Newsboy Goodfellows Club, James Brady. Once off the bridge, Steve steered the cruiser to the left up Casino Way. He took a hard left onto Central and he immediately saw them. Three Detroit police cars, two marked, are stopped on the left side of the one-way road about 200 yards ahead. As Steve got closer, he began to recognize shapes and faces. He knew them all. Galloway, the forensic, is a fat, balding mass of flesh. Lewis, the large back uniformed officer, is from traffic, and the skinny detective, nicknamed Topper, a member of Steve's crew. He pulled up behind them and climbed from his car, a slight weave still present as he stood. As the fresh air filled his lungs, Steve realized that his head ached and his eyes, still bloodshot, hurt. He also realized that no saliva was present in his mouth. Topper spoke first. Steve, you look like shit. Rough night? Fuck you, Steve replied, smiling. What'd we get? Dead girl, white, chestnut hair, good looking, throat slashed, chest mutilated, Topper said. Steve stepped forward toward the statue to view the body. The dead mass of flesh lay innocently on the steps leading up to the white statue of a caped James Brady standing with a young newsboy. The mass of flesh was clad in a red dress. Her upper torso was bare and torn to shreds. Should be easy to ID, Galloway commented. Her face and prints are intact. Good, remarked Steve. I want to know who she is, when she died, and who she was with on her last day breathing oxygen. Galloway nodded and returned to his work, checking the body carefully for evidence. Steve blurted instructions to the uniformed officer and topper, then climbed back into his car. I'll be at the mini station, he said. Get with me when you wrap up the preliminaries. As he pulled away, it dawned on him. This is not the murder scene only the dump site. No blood surrounded the murdered girl. She had to have been killed elsewhere and dumped at the foot of the statue. He drove to the mini station on Belle Isle, which is strangely only a quarter mile from the monument. Step away from the Brady statue, look northeast, and you can see the mini station. The outside of the mini station looks like a modern building. The inside of the station is quite a different story. There are sandbags piled up against the wall for reinforcement, just in case, commented one of the officers. On the windows, there are three-inch plexiglass shutters with a bolt hinge lock. Again, just in case. The entire inside of the mini station looked like something from the days of the Alamo, with modern improvements in communication equipment. Sergeant Shevsky ambled into the station commandeered a desk and began to set up a command post. Automatically, he picked up the telephone and began to dial. He stopped, realizing that he was dialing his ex-girlfriend Tony's number. Fuck, he said, as he slammed the receiver down. He then picked up the phone again and this time called his lieutenant to notify him of the circumstances and the steps that he has taken to begin the investigation. Until he sobers up, this will be his temporary office. A rookie cop brought him a cup of coffee. Steve took the cup and immediately asked for more. Later that afternoon, Steve is back at his real desk. He's feeling better, the hangover almost gone, and he has eaten once, a salad and a diet fago. The preliminary reports are beginning to collect on his desk. Sergeant Shevsky has spoken to his boss twice, once on the phone and once in person. 
A press statement has yet to be released. Not enough details sorted out to go public. Before beginning to read the paperwork, Steve made one more call. His brother's secretary answered. I'm sorry, but Mr. Shevsky is out of the office for the day, she said. Steve left a brief message for his younger brother about the divorce papers, set the receiver back into its carriage, and began to read the reports. Victim, white female, between 22 and 28 years of age, the report begins. Apparent cause of death, multiple stab wounds to the upper chest and neck. Location of death unknown. Body found at approximately 6 a.m. May 10th, 2023, on Belle Isle near the Brady Monument. See attached sheet for name and address of the reporting party. Steve paused to flip the page and recorded the name and address of the jogger who found the body. Back to the report. Victim has shoulder-length dark hair. No distinguishing marks save the wounds and the number one etched on her lower abdomen. Name unknown as of the date of this report. It's signed Patrolman Lewis, badge number 7254. Steve picked up the next report. It's a triangular measurement of the location of the body against fixed points. Artist's sketches note no trace of blood found on the monument steps. Steve wondered aloud, why was she killed? Is this my case? Did this happen in my precinct or am I just doing the preliminary shit for some asshole in the suburbs? The body was found in his precinct. For now, it is his case and no one else's. Steve smiled. He loved being in charge, the center of attention. It allowed him to hide his personal pain. All the world loves a clown, but they never know the person behind the makeup. Steve set down the measurements and sketches, the work of Topper. Steve's happy to have him on his crew. The man, his real name is Saunders, is a very thorough detective and an excellent record keeper. His day is now finished. It's time to go home, and still, Steve has yet to receive confirmation on the identity of the dead girl. Her fingerprints were not on record anywhere, and, as of yet, the coroner has not been able to provide an approximate time of death. A partial report will air on the TV news this evening asking for help in identifying the slain woman. There is always tomorrow, Steve said as he set the paperwork down and headed downstairs to the gym. A good hard workout is exactly what Steve's body required. Weights and a good sweat are his own prescription for a hangover. Also, since the separation, Steve had become conscious of his appearance. Six months of separation have dropped four inches from his waistline and added one and a half inches of muscle to his biceps and upper arms. Steve found himself alone in the weight room. No free weights today. All of his work will have to be done on the precinct's old universal machine, an ancient relic of weights, pulleys, and levers. Today's workout involved chest and triceps. Yesterday's was biceps and back, and tomorrow is scheduled for legs. The workout, although brief, was intense. Sergeant Shevsky finished up on the dip bar. His gray academy shirt soaked and darkened by sweat clings to his body. True definition of the chest can only be obtained on the dip bar, he commented as he finished his routine by removing the shirt and posing in the room's only mirror. An hour later, Steve sits, tense, toned, and tired, on a gray chair in front of his locker. The time is 6.30 p.m. He has just enough time to shower before meeting his brother at the shanty, an Irish pub on the edge of Greektown. The writing on the gray t-shirt he pulls from his gym bag reads, Detroit Homicide. Our day begins when yours ends. How fucking true, Steve said aloud to no one. 9.30 in the evening. Jim Peterson's workday went slowly. He hadn't heard from his girlfriend since their argument last night at the bar. He was an asshole, she called off the engagement, and he left her alone at the bar and walked out. Today, he's sorry. She hasn't returned any of his phone calls. He turned the key to her apartment door. 
she had given him a key months ago when he proposed. Now Jim, intent on apologizing and rekindling the relationship and the upcoming nuptials, is happy she trusted him with a key to her apartment, her privacy, and her belongings. Ellen, he called out softly as he stepped inside the quiet space, a stereo, her stereo, their stereo, softly plays in the background. No answer to his call. He began to look around the tiny apartment for his mate. Without turning on the lights, Jim looked in the kitchen and found nothing except a bottle of gin on the counter. He picked it up, replaced the cap, and put it back in the cupboard. She must not be home, he commented sadly. Probably at Debbie's. He decided to take one last look around before leaving, to see if she came home, changed, and left again, or stayed the night at her sister's. He looked in the bedroom and bathroom, again found no sign of his girlfriend, and casually padded back over to the kitchen, intent on leaving her a note. As one hand reached to pull open the junk drawer and search for paper, the other flipped on the light switch. Jim slipped and went down hard as the light illuminated the room. His elbows and head hurt. They absorbed the shock of hitting the floor. Jim lies on the floor staring at the white walls and mauve wallpaper. They were covered with thick, dried blood. He looked further and saw the red liquid everywhere in the tiny room. The blood trail ended where the drag marks stopped. Jim Peterson vomited and passed out. This episode of Criminal Miles was brought to you by the Michigan Film Network, creators and distributors of revenue-generating entertainment since 2010. To learn more about opportunities with the Michigan Film Network, visit them at MIFN.net. Chapter 3 Steve knew he was at the right place. He knew he wasn't stupid and was fairly positive that he heard his brother correctly. Meet me at Leopards around 10 p.m. That's what Dean had said. It's now 10.30 and Steve is standing at the bar in this downriver strip joint waiting for his brother who, like usual, is nowhere in sight. Having decided against the t-shirt, He's wearing a blue polo shirt, Levi's, and a pair of black loafers, no socks. His revolver, strapped in an ankle holster on his left leg, is barely visible. He carries two wallets, one for his badge and police ID, the other for his driver's license and money. An old police trick to conceal your identity in case you're surprised or get mugged. Crooks sometimes panic and shoot at the sight of a badge. Or, they may beat you just for being a cop and take your off-duty weapon, possibly killing you with your own gun. So, for protection, two wallets. Advice handed down for generations from veterans to rookies. Steve himself had passed that advice on to four rookies, the last one just one month ago. Being alone at the club was starting to creep Steve out. Not that he's scared, but he's starting to feel like one of those guys that comes in and grabs a chair next to the stage, unperverts row, as the locals know it, and sits there for hours, lurking and staring at the dancers while nursing one or two beers without tipping any of the girls. Glitz and glitter. That's how one would describe the decor at Leopard's. All new insides with mirrors, chrome, and leather. Not that anyone ever goes there for the decor. It's the scenery. And now, center stage, three feet away from a filled pervert's row, a petite blonde with beautiful tits is spinning her way around the stripper pole, shaking her goodies at the customers as they toss dollar bills on the stage. Shevsky, like the rest of the crowd, is captivated by the little hottie. He can clearly see the allure, the attraction, that would cause men to hand over money to beautiful women who, in reality, 
are doing nothing more than teasing them, offering false promises in exchange for real cash. Still, he finds it difficult to take his eyes off the gorgeous dancer and the way she moves. It's almost hypnotic and definitely enticing. Every curve on her luscious body is swaying in perfect time with the loud, thumping, bass-filled music echoing throughout Leopards. Watching, one would believe she's there for your pleasure, there for your desires, your cravings and fantasies. A beautiful temptress set to do your bidding. They all are, all the strippers. It's as if this place is your own private harem. All this glitz and glitter is strictly for you and your desires. And the strippers are here strictly to make all your dreams come true. For a price, Steve says, as he forces his gaze away from the pole dancer's sequin thong, focuses on her face and realizes she's not smiling. The look on her face seems to be a stoic mask, a blank stare that, if looked beneath, seems to be housing a deep-seated hatred, a forced contempt. Fuck her, Steve says aloud to no one in particular. Shake your tits, bitch. Smile and earn some money. You chose it. Steve felt the stare a full 30 seconds before he turned his head around to verify and noticed a man in the VIP section burrowing a hole through him with his eyes. Being normally paranoid about people on the streets recognizing him from his days as a patrolman, Shevsky decided this to be a coincidence, chose to ignore the stare and interpret it as a casual glance. He spun himself around, leaned against the oak and leather-fringed bar of the strip joint and began to view the other patrons. He watched as four men in white shirts their ties loosened, slammed their drinks on the table, and quickly gulped the foamy contents. Amaretto, Steve whispered to himself. Just beyond the four men, a young man with blonde hair and a ponytail, dyed brown, tried in vain to speak with a feisty brunette in a green miniskirt and nothing else. Not tonight, Junior, Steve heard the woman say, laughing as he watched her tits jiggle. The ponytail sulked muttered something under his breath, then moved on to other prey. Steve turned his head to look over his shoulder and again noticed the man still staring at him. He chose to ignore this a second time and turned his head to watch one of the strippers being propositioned for a private dance. He watched the dancer accept, pull the man to his feet, and kiss him on the cheek. Shevsky then allowed his glance to follow the stripper and her date back to the champagne room to continue their transaction. Allowing his gaze to circle the room, Steve saw the man still staring at him and finally decided enough was enough. The man was actually staring directly and intentionally at him. He broke from the bar and made straight for the entrance to the VIP area. Three strides from the entrance, two well-muscled bouncers in matching polo shirts, two sizes too small, intercepted him. Going somewhere? The tallest of the pair asked. Steve refused to answer and simply pointed beyond the two giants. Off limits, unless you're invited, the man continued as he maneuvered himself between Steve and the area opening. Again, Steve said nothing, still pointing directly at the staring man and his entourage. The bouncer looked over his shoulder and saw the staring man motion for him to allow Shesky to proceed. He glanced back at Steve and slowly moved aside, allowing access to the VIP area. As Steve climbed the two short steps to the elevated area, he watched a slender black man clad in an expensive red silk gym suit, wad up a dollar bill, stand and throw it baseball style at one of the dancers on the stage, hitting her directly in the crotch. 
He laughed and sat back down as three other members of his party began to follow his lead. Of the five men seated at the table, four threw money at the dancers. One continued to stare at Steve as he approached. Stopping a few feet from the table, Steve made eye contact with his admirer. You looking at me like you know me. His watcher smiled and said nothing as the others in his party ignored their new guest and continued to fire money at the strippers. I arrest you or something? Steve asked. Nope, the man grinned. You taught me how to shoot in the academy. Thornton? Johnny Thornton? Steve asked, searching his brain for the recruit's name. Steve now knew exactly where he recognized this one from. Instantly, he recognized all the others at the table. As Steve reached down to shake Patrolman Thornton's hand, the one in the red sweatsuit spun his head around. What's up, Fibo? He grinned. Fuck you, Steve grunted as he turned his attentions back to the young officer. The fuck you hanging out with these assholes for? They my people, replied Johnny. Lucian? Steve asked, pointing at the red sweatsuit. This piece of shit is nothing but a drug dealer. Still my people, Johnny said. Want some advice, kid? Make new friends, Steve said as he swung around to leave. Before he was able to make his way from the VIP area, Steve saw his brother, sandwiched in between two spandex-clad strippers, emerge from the champagne room and head over to a vacant table. He followed, watching as the strippers rubbed against Dean Shevsky's $500 lawyer suit and pulled neon fabric out from between their creases. Dean sat down and signaled for the waitress. Two shots and two beers for me and my brother, he said without looking up. Then to Steve. Yeah, I saw you. Saw you 45 minutes ago when you came in. Obviously, he grinned. I was too busy to say hello. Who are the idiots up in VIP? Nobody. A rookie cop and a couple of drug dealers. Nothing important, Steve said. Dean looked directly into his brother's eyes. You okay? Mary gave me the message. What a bitch. Not today, okay? Let's talk about something else. How are you? Shit day. In and out of court all morning, Dean said, as the waitress brought back their order and told Dean the drinks were on the house. A young stripper in a tight yellow spandex dress approached and tried to speak with Dean. He brushed her off politely. Later, babe, I want to speak with my brother for a few, he said as he kissed his finger and touched it to her lips. She went away happy, hoping that later we'll eat into morning. Damn, Dean. Couldn't you have kept her here a little longer? I didn't even get a good tit shot. Dean laughed. You never change, do you? Already back on the horse. They clink glasses and down the shots. Business as usual. Steve is now 40 years old. As far back as he can remember, his younger brother has been with him. When Steve was 12 and just beginning to notice girls, his six-year-old brother was tagging along close behind. They remained close throughout the years, and thus Dean grew up six years ahead of his peers. He started to like girls way ahead of his classmates. When puberty arrived and his good looks developed, he found himself light years ahead of all his friends. He's managed to stay ahead of the crowd ever since. When Steve married Stacy, the brothers stopped being inseparable. For Steve, there was a wife and a baby girl, Carrie. Dean tackled college, then eventually law school, and wound up a six-figure attorney with an office in the Renaissance Center. Though each chose his own path and adjusted, they still managed to keep in touch, mostly by phone. Since the separation, Steve had begun to pal around with his younger brother again. For him, it was a shoulder to lean on. Dean simply took it in stride. Demons of old reunited. Dean is very happy to be hanging out with his older brother once again, but this time, things are noticeably different. Now Dean is the ladies' man, and Steve is the one who is tagging along. 
a fact that Dean relishes. He is now the leader of the Shevsky boys. I tell you, Stevie, the Shevsky boys are going to get lucky tonight, especially since you dropped that bimbo, Tony. Be nice, Dean. She's a nice girl. I was the jerk. Bullshit, Dean exclaimed. If that bitch didn't suck dick, she would have been useless. Steve shook his head slowly as Dean continued. Now, let's you and me grab those two strippers and head back to my place. Dean stepped away from his brother and motioned for him to stay put. The younger Shevsky strutted over to the girl in the yellow spandex and gently took her waiting hand. Steve sipped his beer and watched as Dean held the woman's left hand in his own left hand. The right hand was busy massaging her lower back and buttocks. Such suave and sophistication. I taught him well, Steve smiled, having totally forgotten about the young patrolman and his drug dealer companion. To a man sitting alone in a bar, minutes passed like hours. It seemed like forever, but it was only ten minutes later when Dean and Laurie, the blonde in the painted-on yellow spandex, came back over to Steve. The couple, arm in arm, was followed by Laurie's friend, Jody. She's older than Laurie, but just as shapely. Steve was astonished. He almost choked on his beer. Jody's tits must be 40 Ds. A dream come true to a tit man like Steve. Her low-cut pink top was tightly stretched across a pair of mountains. Her cleavage massive and inviting. Each heavy breast was pushed inward and upward by the tight shirt and bra. Bolt-ons, Steve supposed, making an obvious reference to her fake tits. Dean and Laurie stare into each other's eyes, making small talk, leaving the older couple to get to know each other. Steve became aroused just looking at the busty woman. He's 6'3", and she's only 5'4", in stripper pumps. Naturally, he has to look down to speak with this lovely woman. She appears as interested in him as he is in her. Acting like he's looking at her smooth face and sexy green eyes, Steve makes small talk. Actually, his eyes are riveted on the breasts, the mind wondering how large the nipples are, hoping to find out shortly. The small talk lasts a while, with each party verbally feeling out the other. The women, especially Jody, seem to be quite airheaded, possibly bordering on dizzy. But those tits, Steve reminded himself. He was very interested in his new friend. Dean obviously felt likewise. The girls smile and excuse themselves to get their purses. They will be accompanying the brothers to Dean's house to talk politics. One of Dean's favorite lines for sex. Dean leans in to his brother as they watch the ladies shimmy away. I'll do Lori first. Then we'll switch. I have to see those tits up close myself. No way, counselor, Steve elbowed his brother. I ain't sharing. The women return and the foursome prepares to leave. One last round for the road, suggested Jody. The waitress was summoned and they ordered. Steve felt a buzzing on his thigh. His pager was going off. He pulled a small box from his pocket wishing that it were Jody's breasts vibrating against his balls rather than the device. Dean, I'll be right back. I gotta step outside and call the station, he said, holding up the pager. No problem. I'll hold down the fort, big brother, he said, winking at Steve. Steve Shevsky left pissed and alone. Work called. The murder victim now had a name. Ellen something. The murder scene appeared to be her apartment one of the new condos near the stadiums. It's located in his precinct. Steve's team was now officially on the case. He must go to the scene and coordinate the investigation. His crew is already there and questions will have to be answered, people will have to be spoken to, and a plan of action will have to be devised. To Sergeant Shevsky, none of that matters right now. He's pissed. Pissed and horny. 
He's alone and heading to work while Dean has two strippers accompanying him back to his house in Livonia to talk politics. No need to switch, Steve said. Dean will see those titties tonight for damn sure. He slammed his fist on the dashboard. Steve walks up the stairs, running his hands through his short, light brown hair. A hint of alcohol is still on his breath. He puts his palm to his face and blows. Now, feeling confident enough to go to work, he takes his shield and clips it to the waistband of his jeans. The front door to Ellen's apartment is open. He steps in. His detectives are hard at work. The boys from forensics are also busy, gathering blood samples from the kitchen. White powder is scattered throughout the apartment as the techs dust and check for latent prints. Two of Steve's crew, Topper and a short barrel-chested Italian named Vinoli, have Jim Peterson seated in the kitchen. Peterson's hair is mussed up and his eyes are swollen from crying. Dried vomit covers the front of his shirt. Topper's long, delicate fingers are wrapped around a pencil. He's busy scribbling in a notebook as Jim Peterson utters incoherently. A short, fat, buck-toothed cop named Stan Walker waddles up to Steve. Hey, Sarge, what we got? Steve asked while staring at Topper and Joe Vinoli, half interested in keeping the smell of booze from going directly into Stan's face. That's the boyfriend, said Stan. We'll print him later. He came over to see Ellen open the door with his key. Says that he's her fiance or was. Anyway, he looks all over the apartment for her then walks in the kitchen and flips the light on. The kid pukes. The rest you can guess. What does it look like? asked Steve. Like someone squirted ketchup all over the walls, said Stan. Techs are almost done if you want the three dollar tour. Thanks, maybe later. What's the dead girl's name? asked Steve. Super IDs the tenant as Ellen Adams, 25, pretty with shoulder-length black hair, nice legs. Picture in the bedroom looks exactly like the victim. Topper and Joe are trying to talk the boyfriend into coming to the morgue for a positive, said Stan. Okay, good. Topper and Benoli know what to do. Leave them with the boyfriend. You stay with forensics. I want to know if they get any usable prints. I want this nutcase soon. That number etched on her abdomen worries me. We have to get him before he starts counting. Steve turned and walked towards the bedroom. He stopped and yelled over his shoulder. Stan, get some uniforms to knock on doors. I want all the tenants interviewed. Someone had to have seen or heard something. Steve opened the door and entered his apartment. It's 3.15 a.m., the end of a long day. He's exhausted. He stares at the shabby apartment. Twenty years ago, he rented the place as a mailing address, a crash pad, so that he could work for the department. Damn residency law, he remembered saying. Now he was glad that he rented it. If he hadn't, he would have been homeless when Stacy asked him to leave. This shitty dump, Steve Shevsky now bitterly refers to as home. The red light on his recorder was blinking. Someone called. The machine irritated him. He hated recording the message on it. Stupid. Talking into a machine so other people I don't even want to speak with can leave me a message. Interrupt and invade my privacy, Steve thought. Still, he kept the machine. It served a purpose. It was his screening device. Now he doesn't have to answer the phone and can still hear the important messages. This message is from Tony, the redhead ex-girlfriend. She wants to try again. Sorry, Steve. No more talk of commitment. He clicked the recorder off before the message finished playing. Steve then stormed over to the refrigerator and grabbed a beer, hoping to keep his emotions in check and avoid another blackout. The TV is on. His expression is stoic. He's alone with his thoughts. No Jody with the tits, no Stacy and their daughter, and no desire to get back with Tony. 
Steve closes his eyes to erase the tension and shield himself from the creeping depression. Memories of sex with Tony begin to surface. To Steve, dreams, whatever they are, are better than no memories at all. It all began about a month after Steve and Stacy separated. Feeling sad and alone, Steve began hanging out in bars, drinking to excess and blacking out, almost a habit at this point. The blackouts came about twice a week, a quick trip down the lonely but frequently traveled road of alcohol. One night, Steve was about half in the bag, working on his tenth strokes, when this cute little redhead shimmied over and introduced herself. Her name was Tony, and she told Steve of her attraction to tall men with strong hands. He smiled and squeezed the beer can a little tighter, its sides buckling from the pressure. Silly macho shit. It had been years since he had even thought of another woman, much less enjoyed one. Now, here he sat. The alcohol had him relaxed and curious, with a gorgeous redhead, a natural with firm tits, coming on to him. He decided to see it through, test the limits. Small talk led to a provocative, inviting conversation, an offer. The television plays on. Steve dozes and flashbacks of Tony continue. They went back to her house. She then excused herself, closing the bedroom door behind her. Steve, aroused and confident, waited 10 minutes when Tony emerged from behind the door wearing only high heels and a black bra. The red triangle confirmed his guess. Tony was a true redhead. Slowly, she strutted over to him, climbed upon his lap, straddled him, and wrapped her milky white legs around his waist. No words were exchanged, only stares. Looks of passion. Steve reached around behind her, unhooked the lace bra, and Tony slowly leaned forward, lowering her shoulders. The bra slid off, revealing firm white breasts with tiny erect nipples. Pink rosebuds set against a sea of baby's breath flowers. She shoved his face down, his jaw rubbed against cleavage until a tiny erect nipple found its way between his lips. Tony whispered, bite it. Her voice hoarse, deep, and throaty. Steve bit gently at first. She moaned with pleasure as he increased the pressure. The gymnastics had begun. Arms and legs intertwined. His hairy torso now exposed meshed against soft, milky flesh. The struggle was pleasurable. They were now on the bed, making it squeak. The headboard banged steadily against the wall as Steve pushed hard, fast, and deep. Her painted nails dug deeply into his muscular back. A trail of scratches is left as a memory. It hurt at the time, but strangely, he enjoyed the pain. So did Tony. Her orgasm was long, enormous, and joyful. Tony motioned for him to roll over on his back and lie perfectly still. He obliged. She quickly changed positions and took his swollen member into her mouth. At first, just a head. Then, all of him. His body quivered with pleasure as he stared at her. The red hair, must from movement, bounds up and down. She worked hard. Every inch of him was taken into her mouth. Steve felt a passion as her hand stroked his thigh and scrotum. A wince, his cock pulsed, she relaxed and swallowed all that he could offer. Round one over, the relationship began. Steve's dreams shift. He enjoyed peaceful sleep, REM sleep, dream sleep, hard, erect, dream sleep. For more information on this podcast, visit the Michigan Film Network at 
MIFN.net. Get your copy of Miles Lawrence's book, Keeping Score, on Amazon today, so you can read along with each episode. To order a signed copy of the book, or to meet Miles Lawrence at a local bookstore, follow him on Facebook. Please be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to Criminal Miles so you don't miss upcoming episodes. All stories told on this podcast are done so with the written consent from the author, Miles Lawrence. No portion of this podcast may be rebroadcast or otherwise distributed without the expressed written consent of the Criminal Miles production team and the author, Miles Lawrence. Criminal Miles is part of the Michigan Film Network podcast series. This episode of Criminal Miles was recorded in the basement of the Michigan Film Network. Thank you.